goes over and above. All right. Well, then let me, let me open us with a brief prayer. I'll do an introduction, and then I will make sure that you've got all control of the screen, all right? Love it. Let us pray. Uh, loving God, as we enter the um, third week of Lent, as we continue our journey learning about, studying, exploring crucifixion and its many motifs, uh, we ask that you bring us together in spirit. Uh, be with us as we gather near and far. Uh, here in Haverkamp, uh, digitally, uh, and later this afternoon at the National Gallery of Art. Uh, inspire us and lead us on you all. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Great scarf. Here's Judy. We just talked about it. Yeah. Got my purple one. <laughs> so today we uh, have a, a wonderful um, uh, guest speaker. Megan, from a tour of her own, she is with us today, not only virtually now at 945, but also will lead the guided tours at the National Gallery of Art later this afternoon um, at 1 o'clock and at 2.30. Uh, for everyone watching now virtually and folks here, there is space in both slots available if anyone is still interested. Um, she is from a tour of her own, which is an all-female based, ran, organized, uh, empowered and envisioned tour group based in Washington, D.C. Caitlin, is that is that fair? Excellent. Thank you yes. so much. No, I'm so glad that you are here. And uh, we are just incredibly honored to have each and every one of you here this morning. Patrick, hello. Hey, Jacob. Hey, everybody. Hi there, Patrick. All right. Thank you so much. Here, let's give, let's give Megan and two of their own a round of applause. <laughs> I also just want to say thank you to everybody. My name is Caitlin. I'm the founder of this company. It just means a lot to be with you today on this Sunday. And I think you're really going to enjoy these tours. It's my honor to be with you and to also uh, share Megan's work with you. So thank you. Enjoy. And Megan, teach us something today. <laughs> All right, excellent. So when Caitlin approached me with this project, I was actually really excited. I love doing kind of niche deep dives and the fact that we've got a virtual and an in-person component. And so we're actually gonna have two different focuses for the two different parts. And so for the uh, in-person component, of course, we're working with the National Gallery's collection, what we can see in person. Now, that means that it's based on an already existent collection. And so for this particular program, I thought that it would be fun to do a deeper dive into women that have painted, that were professional artists, and their depictions of the crucifixion. Now, I will say I did a little bit of a generous interpretation. So I'm including uh, the crucifixion, I'm including Pieta, I'm including Lamentation. So that kind of those, you know, few hours right around the death of Christ and his removal from the cross. Now we're gonna cover things from the 1500s up until the 2000s. I'm super excited and uh, so, Let's jump in. Now, I'm actually going to start with one of the boys. So those of you that were here, we were uh, prepping. So I've got Vincent van Gogh, one of the most famous artists in art history. And I've chosen his self-portrait with bandaged ear. And the reason for that is because this particular self-portrait actually has a lot of crucifixion iconography. And so the easel that you see in his background, that's actually been manipulated to look a little bit more like a crucifix. Uh, the bandage uh, really kind of looking a bit like kind of gory, like it's awkward. It's not, doesn't look very neatly placed, uh, very represented or very kind of akin to the wounds of Christ. But especially I actually wanted to focus in on the Japanese woodblock print that you see behind. Now that Japanese woodblock print comes from Vincent's personal collection. He had he and his brother had over 400 of them. But this specific woodblock print is known as the three geishas. And it this is the what actually seals this as having kind of crucifixion iconography. Because with the crucifixion, we often see what's known as the three Marys. You have Mary the mother of Christ, you have Mary Magdalene and you have Mary Cleophas, the mother of the uh, mother of two of his disciples. 
And why I wanted to start with this, even though this is not necessarily going to be the main focus of this part of the project, is because I think it's really fascinating that some of the most consistent figures that you see with Christ are the women. The women are meant to be our touchstones. The women are supposed to represent our humanity reacting to this act of God, this kind of mind-blowing, uh, almost impossible to kind of encompass uh, this gesture of intense faith. And so women have always been part of the crucifixion story, whether they are painted no, by men, whether they are painted by women. Isn't she just showing the painting of... Sorry? I'm sorry. I thought I thought perhaps we're still looking at the picture with with the bandage here. Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry. So so in order, so basically what Vincent has done here is by using three women in the background and the cross in the background, those are two of the biggest uh, kind of images that parallel this with descents from the cross. And so I kind of am just using this as an explanation or a making a point that women have always been part of the crucifixion iconography. And so with that, then we are going to move into uh, women painting the crucifixion because a lot of times women are going to bring a different angle and a different idea to the stories that we're seeing. Now, I do also want to mention uh, that women artists, they are hard to dig out of history. It's been about 50 years since a essay in 1971 uh, Linda Nochlin wrote, why have there been no great women artists? Now, she's being a little snarky because a gallery owner friend of hers in New York City said, well, I'd love to do an exhibition of female artists. I just can't seem to find any great ones. Mm -hmm. And so she goes through in this essay and talks a lot about some of the limitations that were put on women as artists. Now, a lot of people, when they think of female artists, they're expecting women that are part of artistic families and therefore are kind of able to work under a father or brother or a husband's name. But we also find that there are women artists that are in convents and we're going to be talking about uh, a nun. We are also going to find though that with, uh, as explored in this essay, a lot of times these women were incredibly famous during their time. And then within a couple decades of their death, their colleagues, their contemporaries, they kind of stop talking about them. A lot of their work does get reattributed to mentors and things like that. And so while there probably is significantly more iconography and crucifixion imagery coming from female art artists, a lot of it has been obscured by the written history. So I managed to dig out about six artists that we want to focus on for this particular uh, program. Now we're going to start with a nun. We're going to start with Plautilla Nelly. And so she is going to be working in the 1500s. Now she comes from a pretty wealthy family and she's not the oldest girl. And so what these wealthy families would sometimes do is they would encourage their daughters to join convents because then they don't have to come up with a dowry for the daughters to get married. And so at the age of 14, Plautilla Nelly joins a convent in Florence. Now, this particular convent was not cloistered, so she's allowed to get out and to explore and be influenced by the art of the period, the art in collections, and of course, Florence is one of the most famous artistic cities back then and today, and so she has a lot to work with, but one of the things that she's not is formally trained, and one of the big limitations for that means that she's not allowed to work from the, hu or she's not allowed to study nude humans. And so this causes some of her colleagues to be a little dismissive of her art. They find some of her male figures seem a little on the feminine side. They also think that she focuses a lot on women because that's who she has access to. But for a self-taught artist, she is spectacularly incredible. Now, the other thing to know about this time period is that this is going to be the time of Savonarola. So Savonarola is a monk and he's kind of the original hellfire and brimstone teacher. And in fact, 
actually I've got in this slide, we've got Platila Nelly. It's not a best resolution self-portrait, but we have her in her habit uh, and getting ready to paint. And then we have Savonarola. Now, like I said, the original Hellfire and Brimstone preacher. And he is going about and he is telling the city of Florence that the reason why they're suffering from plagues and uh, going, getting devastated by war and losing all these battles and such is because Florence has become far too vain. And they're too interested in all of the things that their wealth and their money can buy. And so he's trying to convince them to lead a more godly lifestyle. Now, his most famous act is creating the bonfire, the vanities, where uh, there's big bonfires in front of the Duomo in Florence and little 14-year-old boys will run around. And if you're wearing jewelry or fancy cloaks, they'll rip them off of your shoulders and throw them into the fire. In fact, actually, the famous artist Botticelli even throws some of his own art onto the fire because he thinks he's not necessarily being doing this for the glory of God, but for the glory of himself. But one of the other things that Savonarola does is he encourages female painters. And so he wants women to take up painting because it's a way of pushing away sloth. It's a way of focusing. It's a way of meditating. And it's a way of worship. And so we have Platilla Nelly, and she is working a lot during this period. She has a number of female patrons, and especially uh, the leaders of convents and abbeys. In fact, she ends up being the prioress three different times of her own abbey. Now, I'm going to start with a close-up of her crucifixion that we saw earlier, because I love kind of the simplicity with the symbols that she has here. And so we've got the two, uh, <laughs> the two staffs that we associate with the crucifixion. And so on our right-hand side, we have the staff with the, the hyssop, with the vinegar, uh, when Christ says that he's thirsty. And then on the left, we have the spear that pierces his side, proving that he has died. And in the prophecies of the Old Testament, I'm sure you've covered that uh, one of the part of the prophecy is, is that he will not have any broken bones. And the way that crucifixion works, it's not the blood loss, it's actually the suffocation that kills you. And so a lot of times they are trying to hold themselves up so that they can open up their lungs to be able to breathe. And it's as they get more and more tired that they can't hold themselves up that this becomes a, a an excruciating death. And what we see is the breaking of the legs is a way to speed along that process. And so the staff proves that they do not need to break his legs, which is, of course, very useful after the resurrection. But also, after his death, we have the eclipse. And so we have the sun over on the left. We have the moon on the right. Now, I do love the way that she's done the body of Christ, these long, sinuous lines we do have uh, some musculature in here and a wrapping for modesty. We also have the blood from the crown of thorns and the dripping wound on the side. And so what we see here is as opposed to looking at the brutality and the gore and the intensity and the torture, what Platilinelli has chosen to focus on instead is going to be the, the pain the suffering, that internal aspect, and that internal aspect, uh, that humanity, uh, because of course, Christ is both. He is God, he is human. And uh, in that the, uh, the crucifixion book that I believe you guys are working through with your Bible study, uh, talking about that idea that, you know, <laughs> at different points in time, the godliness was the focus or the humanity was the focus, but finding that balance is such an incredible, delicate thing to do. And so I think that we've got this really uh, fantastic uh, empathy that we see here. Now, this particular painting is actually in the process of being restored. And so there is a group uh, that may have just uh, had to reincorporate, 
but advancing women artists. And so they work out of Italy, working on finding these women that are especially hidden away in religious institutions and bringing their artwork back to the modern understanding. Now, what you're seeing here is varnish removal. And this is also something that is really important when looking at paintings and understanding what you're seeing is varnish is used to protect paintings, especially before, before electricity. It's gonna keep dust, it's gonna keep soot from getting into that paint layer. But the varnishes do tend to yellow with age and they do have to be removed every so often. So if a painting hasn't been cleaned in a number of years, we may get a very different effect, especially with the colors. And so you can see with this removal, we go from having kind of a dark, moody, shadowed sort of Christ into a bright, uh, pale, uh, but well-lit, well-illuminated Christ. And that will give you a little bit of a different sense, especially the emotion, depending on how we see the colors and how we relate to the colors. And so I wanted to bring that in here. Now, Plautila Nelly, uh, she is, gets a lot of commissions, especially for churches and private chapels. And so she is also very famous for the Lamentation, which was also very recently restored. This one draws inspiration from many of her male contemporaries. This one has had some criticism that, again, she's more just kind of copying things. And yet, again, there's a different focus. A lot of times in the 1500s, this is gonna be just after the high Renaissance of da Vinci and Michelangelo and Raphael with that kind of perfection of lighting and shadow and depth and the human figure. And so we're pushing into the style that comes next. It's called mannerism. And in mannerism, it's all about distortion for dramatic effect and really kind of digging in to these emotions, to these ideas. Now, what I love about the lamentation is I love the fact that all of the figures surrounding Christ really are the women. These are the intimates. We've got, again, we've got the Virgin Mary and we've got Mary Magdalene. So Mary Magdalene is most likely going to be this one in red with her hair loose. Mary Magdalene represents kind of the most human of us. She is somebody that according to various accounts, she may be kind of an amalgamation of two different women. She might be one specific uh, depending on which biblical historian you're talking to. There's the sister of Martha and Lazarus. There's the uh, sinner that comes to Christ and she breaks open and she cries on his feet and she wipes them with her hair and the ointment. And so we've got two women actually that are kind of similar to that iconography here. Uh, this one of course is kind of reenacting that whole washing of the feet. But Mary Magdalene most often is identified as a redeemed sinner. She is someone that has spent her life making choices that aren't in line with the plan of God. And she comes to Christ and she's able to truly and fully repent. And she's able to become a, a, a Christian. She's able to find salvation. Now, Mary, the mother of Christ, of course, blessed are you among women. This is going to be the idealized woman. This is the woman that we aspire to be, that pious, that humble, and that gracious in the face of adversity. She is someone that when she has her firstborn son, she understands he is destined for a torturous, awful, awful death in order to fulfill an amazing destiny. And so it is uh, that Mary that we aspire to be, that grace under pressure, that grace on, in the face of suffering. Now we also have Veronica over here. So Veronica is not quite a, as often as the three Marys, but she is a very common woman to see in this uh, setting. And so she is the one, she takes a veil and she wipes the face of Christ. Now the veil uh, is said to still reside at, at the Basilica of St. Peter, the Vatican in, uh, in Vatican City. And so she's another one of these pious women, this idea that you need to act 
when you see things going on around you, you uh, need to con uh, act with compassion and act uh, to work through this situation. And so we have all of these women. One of the things that's really noted though in this particular painting that we don't see in the male contemporaries is if we look at their eyes, they're all red. They've been crying their eyes out. This absolute abject sorrow that we have here. And that's not how we often see the women with the male artists. They're often kind of uh, idealized into these almost stereotypes. These women, they feel very human and they're giving us this full range of human emotions in reaction to the death of Christ. So this is again, our lamentation zoomed out. And the gentlemen, while they do have emotion, they do seem just a little pulled back, a little bit more reserved. And really it is uh, the women that are embodying the humanity of this piece. Now, coming back to her crucifixion, this was part of a series of three and the, the lunette, that's gonna be uh, why it's that half circle shape in the ceiling. So this is going to be the centerpiece. That kind of explains a little bit of the symmetry, a little bit of this balance, but it also then kind of reminds us that this is a play on life and death because we have the life while he's drinking. We have the death with the spear, life and death, the sun, the moon. There's, the crucifix is what holds the passion story together. The, actually the whole gospel story together because without the crucifixion, there is no Easter. There is no res miraculous resurrection. There is no going through the pain of humanity. And so again, the, the crucifixion book that you are working through talks about how all of the four kind of main gospels, how it's all a build up to this point. And at some level, the resurrection, the ascension, that all starts to get into uh, the resolution. So here, I love the way that this almost has that very visual climax as it pushes our eyes up and out with the uh, sticks, the stakes, and into this idea of we have reached a pinnacle of the drama and the trauma in this particular painting. Now, another one of the women artists that paints religious scenes is going to be Sofonispa Angusula. So Sofonispa Angusula, she is born in Italy, but she really comes to fame in the court of Spain. She's particularly admired by the Spanish queen Elizabeth of Valois, who is married to Philip II. Now, Elizabeth of Valois was an amateur painter, and so she hires Sofonispa to be her tutor. Now, she uh, basically, she starts out mostly doing portraiture. And then eventually, later in life, she comes to these religious scenes. And so while we come back to the Pieta, I'm telling you a little bit about her. Let's have her self-portrait up here. And so, so when Elizabeth of Valois dies, uh, Sofonispa, she's become the official court painter in Spain. And this is, again, in the uh, 1500s. That is not a super common thing to have a female court painter, but it is definitely something that did exist. And so Philip II, he actually gives Sofonispa a dowry so that she gets married in her 40s. And then actually she doesn't like that husband and uh, he dies. And so she marries again a little bit later to a ship's captain. Between her pension basically from Philip II and the ship's captain's uh, income, she's able to live a life of leisure and focus on her artwork. Now, I do love the fact that we have here in 1556, though, she is showing herself painting a devotional. And the idea of this self-portrait as a painter, this is something that's starting to come into play in the 1500s. And it's a way of stating who you are and stating your identity. Now, I find it interesting because, again, this is going to be the period where she's actually more known for portraiture, for court painting, for, you know, the, the kings, the queens, <laughs> all of the fine fabrics and the jewelry and really the things of this earth. And so uh, when she paints herself, 
choosing to paint a devotional. I think this is pulling from deep within her inner soul. And this idea that this is really well, what it means to her. This is what she wants to be painting. And this is where her heart lies. You know, there's a practical aspect of painting portraiture, but this is once, especially once she becomes kind of independently wealthy, this is the road that she does go down. Now to come back uh, to her painting, we've got the Pieta. And so the Pieta here, of course, is going to, this is going to be a fairly popular subject among female painters, especially, because you really do have that zeroing in on the feminine energy, that maternal energy. And I think it's worth pointing out that up until even really the 1950s, infant mortality, childhood mortality, this is incredibly high that a lot of times children uh, will die before the age of six. And honestly, you don't really kind of count on them surviving to adult adulthood until they survive the age of 10. And so I think with the Pieta, a lot of times what we're seeing is that reaching out and that reaching in to a very common human emotion, this idea that the uh, many of the adults looking at these paintings are going to know the pain of outliving their children because it's very unlikely that all of the children that they've had have survived to adulthood, especially between miscarriages and stillbirths, but even after many, many children do die on young childhood. Now, of course, this is an adult child, but that idea of, you know, outliving your son of knowing what that losing that piece of your heart is uh, there's that incredible sense of connecting back to the viewer and like I said with uh, Platila Nelly I think that that's one of the fascinating things that we see these women coming up but especially the way that these women are able to take their own experiences and the experiences of their close, close friends and bring that kind of subtlety. What I love is her expression, that kind of that resting face where the grief has almost kind of like she she's kind of beyond tears. She's beyond frustration. She just looks so incredibly empty as she holds her son as he lies limp in her arms and on her lap. And I also love the detail of the arm coming back on top, that idea of it almost seems like he's reaching for her, but he can't grasp her. The way that she's trying to hold his hip and hold that kind of awkward uh, sense of having an adult male draped across an adult female, the physics don't work very well. And so all of this kind of this clutching for purpose, for meaning, uh, really allows us to get to the heart of the devastation. But of course, without this devastation, we don't have the miraculousness of the Easter resurrection. And so uh, this idea of really drawing us in and letting us feel the depths and the pain is the only way that we're going to really then be able to emerge three days later. Now, the next female artist is going to be another Italian. The Italians are, Italian art in the 1500s is fairly well documented. Uh, so we do have a guy by the name of Giorgio Vasari. He writes on the lives of the artists. And he actually, a couple of the women that he does talk about is Platila Nelli, is going to be talking about uh, Sofinispa, Sofinispa and Gasula. Uh, but again, they aren't nearly as well documented as their male contemporaries, but they're much better documented than a lot of the non-Italian women that they are contemporary with. Uh, so Lavinia Fontana, now she holds an interesting distinction. She is said by some to be the first female career painter. And what they mean by that is that she is the one that is the breadwinner of the family and she earns she, she earns the money. Uh, her husband is an agent. And actually her husband is the one that stays home and raises the 11 children that she has. Now this, uh, the dead Christ with the symbols of the passion. Of course, we have the cross 
coming down. Uh, we've got the agents around and we've got the, uh, the crown, crown of thorns down on the ground. We've got uh, shackles, we've got the sword, we've got the spear, we've got all of these things here. Now this is going to be a very dramatically lit piece, uh, especially by the late 1500s. And as we start to get into the early 1600s, uh, we're really starting to get into some of those. Uh, it's not, the scenes no longer look like they're painted at high noon. We're starting to get into them shadows for the depths and for the kind of emotions that they can inspire as well. Now, Lavinia is going to be a contemporary of Sophonisba. Actually, Sophonisba is a contemporary of a lot of people because she lives until the age of 93. So Ooh. Lavinia does not live quite as long. Uh, as you can see, she lives kind of into her 60s, uh, which is still quite old for the time. But I love this self-portrait in the studio that she has here because she's showing herself to be accomplished, to be sophisticated, to be a student of art. And so Lavinia, we've got the classical sculptures, the classical imagery. We've got the fact that she is well read, uh, the book, the pen, and of course, the very large crucifix. Now, this is going to be a time when the Catholic Church is making a major emphasis on family values, on bringing the focus back. We're starting to get into the point uh, just before like the, uh, the Reformation, which then of course is going to lead the counter, or sorry, for you know, Reformation, counter-Reformation period where they're kind of having to analyze the uh, facade that they're putting out to the people. And uh, so Lavinia Fontana is gonna be working during that period. Now she's from Bologna in, uh, in Italy. And so she actually is running with a number of successful female artists. There's about 30 of them actually operating in Bologna. Most of them were inspired by Sofonispa. And, but she's probably the most prominent. Again, portraiture, mythology, religious art. And so this is a close up. Now, what I find a little fascinating on this one is while Sofonispa had actually met Michelangelo, hers was probably the least pronounced Physica, physical Christ as far as the abs and things like that. Uh, we had Plautila Nelli uh, with those very sharp lines. I would say Lavinia Fontana kind of walks the uh, line between the two of them. And so we see though that bright, bright red again, it almost is an unnatural looking red as the dripping wound comes from the side. Now this one isn't kind of as deep uh, gash. Uh, in fact, I would actually suspect that Thomas might have a hard time getting his entire hand into Lavinia Fontana's uh, spear wound uh, once Christ gets resurrected. But you kind of have that pallor, that idea of, you know, the life has left that kind of unnatural, unhealthy uh, look about him. But also, again, this emphasis on the human nature, the way that he needs to be supported by the people around him. And she's also put him, uh, you know, with the, with the mount in the background, and it almost looks like she has put in a more typical Roman cross. Now, a, Roman, a proper Roman crucifix is actually in the shape of a capital T. And the idea is, is that you walk with the crossbar and then you're attached to the end of a pole and then you're propped up. Uh, the reason why the Christian crucifix normally looks like a lowercase t is because of the detail about the sign that Pontius Pilate puts on top and it says that it's put on top of Christ. And so in order for that to kind of work out properly, we, uh, we add a little extra above and we have that cross beam fastened a little bit lower on the Christian crucifix. And so I do find it also kind of interesting, though, when we do have artists that seem to have that preference almost for the actual piece of torture device, especially with the Italians, since this is going to be an area that has a lot of that Roman legacy, that might be something that they were actually exposed to. And so, again, we have that emphasis on pain, on suffering, on torture. Now, as we come out of the 1500s and out of Italy, we're going to find a little bit more obscure artist, uh, Maria Jos 
Josefa Sanchez. And in fact, she's so obscure, I don't have actual birth dates and death dates for her. The best we can narrow it down is to when she's active in the mid 1600s, so 1639 to 1649. And so this crucifixion just very recently entered the Art Institute of Chicago's collection. She's known for having four crucifix total, that's her total known uh, avoir, and the other three are in chapels. And so there's been a thought that perhaps she was a nun. However, she often signed her works, she often signed her works with the uh, title Donna, as opposed to uh, uh, Sor, which is gonna be sister. So it does sound like she was an independent woman. She was not a woman of the church. Uh, but the fact that she does then specialize in these crucifixes are kind of interesting. Now, this is a very kind of dramatic depiction of Christ. So we've got Christ right before the moment of death. We can see that godliness glowing around the crown of thorns. Again, we've got a much more subtle sun and moon than we had with Plautile and Nelly. <laughs> but we've got that very intense, almost emaciated musculature, really emphasizing that pain, that frustration, and also a little bit of that abandonment, that isolation. And so, of course, one of the famous uh, words of the crucifixion, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you really do get the sense of someone that feels like they have been abandoned and left behind uh, in this particular depiction of Christ. Now, it's kind of interesting that she's added to this very isolated, tortured, abandoned Christ a depiction of the Virgin Mary. And so this is the Immaculate Virgin as well. And so rather than the Holy Mother, this is the emphasis on the uh, uh, first or uh, the, the best of you among, or you're the best among women sort of thing. There's, but also that sort of ascension, uh, the, the coronation of the Virgin. We have these very light robes here, that very young face, that kind of enthroned in heaven idea of like a crown and a sun, the moon at her feet. So she's above the earth at this point. And so when I see this, I wonder about that thought of her kind of seeing this through. Like, can you imagine, you know, she must have wanted to run away so many times to grab her son, flee to the ends of the earth, no matter how impossible it is to leave God's sight and God's influence. And yet there's that incredible instinct of that maternalness that we talk about, that we see in the Pieta, but it's balanced with that piousness, with that faith, the faith of Abraham as he, sac as he starts to sacrifice his son, Isaac. She actually has to go through with it. She actually has to stand there and watch as her son dies, as God does not stop and intervene and provide a sacrificial animal at the last moment. And that is why she is the one that we try to live up to. That's why she is that uh, that incredible example of what it is to be a true and pious Christian is facing that suffering, accepting that suffering, and understanding that no matter how much pain it is causing us, that there is a greater purpose and a greater message within. So as we come back to that, I also find it's kind of interesting that we see her still though positioned below. And I think that that really emphasizes that interpretation, that idea that she is kind of the support. Uh, she is still occupying that place at the base of the cross, that connection to Christ. And in some ways she is also letting go of her son, maybe not quite abandoning him to the point of, you know, why hast thou forsaken me? But she is taking that step back. She is giving him to God. She is giving him to the world. 
Now, I decided to include this particular painting because I did want to get a little bit more into the modern era. And I, this has a bit more, this definitely has a more modern style. Also, it does have some kind of echoes of Vincent van Gogh, uh, since I did talk about him at the beginning, the beautiful yellow in the background and those strong, strong brush strokes. Now, this again is a Pieta, so of course the focus is very narrow. It's very quiet, it's very intimate, it's Mary and her son. Now, Irma Stern, she is a, a German Jewish uh, artist that spends most of her time uh, headquartered kind of in South Africa, that's where she's born. She does spend a lot of time in Europe as well. She studies in Germany, but she comes back to South Africa. Her museum is in Cape Town. And she also travels extremely extensively. And she travels quite a bit. Uh, she's married for about 10 years, but then she divorces her husband and she travels by herself through the continent of Africa through the through Europe, except in Nazi Germany. She is Jewish after all, she is not going to step foot inside Hitler's Germany, but she brings in all of these different influences from indigenous art and the tribal art that we think of with Africa, Islamic art. And the fact that she's Jewish, I find it fascinating that she was drawn to paint a Pieta. And so as we come back and look at that, so when it comes to this kind of post Vincent van Gogh expressionist sort of art, what you're looking at is the brush strokes. You're looking at the way they flow and that they interact with each other, the different colors, which ones are mixed together, which ones are layered on top of each other and how that kind of draws your eye and focuses it. And so take this particular plant here. You can see that actually our stem goes on top of our red and that kind of pulls your vision down, always down with the crucifix. Uh, this is gonna be kind of the opposite of uh, Platila Nelly's crucifixion where your eye is drawn up to the pinnacle, to, the, uh, to that pressure point of the passion story. The Pieta, that is how we are coming down. We're coming down from the cross. And so our eye keeps being drawn to the ground, to the base. The way that she kind of caresses uh, Mary with her brush strokes here, especially around her shoulders, it's almost like she's giving an embrace to the Virgin. This idea, the way that you want to comfort a grieving mother, uh, the way that you know nothing is going to make it better, but you want her to know that uh, there is support out there. It's this very human, again, this idea of connecting in to the emotions of this piece, connecting into what all of this means, uh, not just for you know the religion, but what it means for the people involved. And the people involved do include us. They include the congregate, they include the congregates, they include the children of God, because we are part of this story. And so whether it is wanting to reach out through time, through space, to tell Mary that we appreciate her sacrifice, that we understand the intense level of, or empathize that there must be an intense level of pain for those of us that have not gone through the loss of a child. And I love, also love the way she's painted Christ almost as if he's kind of slipping out of her, uh, away from her, out of her grasp, out of her vision, the details are starting to get more, almost more blurred the longer you look at it. And because of course his spirit has descended into hell for that epic battle that then allows him to claim victory over death. And so the corporeal form of Christ is no longer who he is. And so you almost kind of see that slipping away, that effect Effect. And so I think that that, uh, especially considering that she has so many other influences kind of popping around in her head. I mean, at the point where she paints this, she is in her 50s. Uh, uh, and so she's had a lot of her experiences uh, that of her travel, of her marriage. And one of the things that she actually was known for early in her career was her paintings of children. Now she kind of stops painting children after her divorce. 
Uh, there's a thought that she kind of gives up on the hope of having children. And so that may also be what kind of brings her back to this part of the Christian story, that uh, maternal loss, because although she doesn't have, she hasn't lost a child, she's lost the hope of a child. She's lost the vision of a child. She's lost uh, that peace uh, it sound, that it seems like from her works that she may have deeply, deeply desired at one time. And so we have that as well. Now with these colors, we do have kind of those a little bit, maybe a slight sense, they're bright, but there's also kind of the slight aspect of almost putrefication. There's a little bit of green in there that sets it off. It's not just a happy, joyous painting. There is this kind of level of, you know, the colors look like they might have a little bit of illness, a little bit of, you know, not being fully healthy. And in fact, the flowers themselves, they look a little wilted. And that I feel like also re just reinforces that sadness of this part of the story and the idea that this is when things can go wrong. Until you skip ahead a few chapters, till you get to Easter, this is not a good thing. This only becomes a good thing because of how the story ends. This is the part where it could still go sideways and it could still mean the destruction of humanity and the condemnation of humanity. Now, as we uh, come up, as I said, I do try to allow a bit of time for questions and such. And so I'm, uh, we're going, this is going to be our last artwork but I want you to take a note as to how massive this artwork is. This artwork is four and a half meters by seven and a half. Oh, that's a centimeters. That's a lie. It's seven and a half meters. This thing is massive. Uh, it's actually on tour in the United States. Probably the closest to us that it's going to reach is Rochester, New York, July through October. Now, this is going to be an African work of art. It's known as the African Crucifixion. It was created in 2008. Now it's got this beautiful, te almost textured looking surface because it's made out of beads. And one of the things that we see is <clears throat> women are often relegated to the domestic arts. And what I mean by that is decorative arts, the things, uh, not basically not painting, not sculpture, that's fine art. That is often uh, considered the male domain for a lot of history. And so we see a lot of women, especially in the modern era, trying to reclaim these domestic arts, whether it's weaving, whether it's quilting, whether it's beadwork, and arguing that this deserves the same respect and same recognition as the fine arts that are traditionally collected by those old standards of European and North American museums. And so, now this particular collective, the Ubale women, so it started by two women. Uh, they're up to they're up to about seven women, but they've actually lost about five of their artists to HIV or AIDS. They are in kind of the very rural area of South Africa. They're using extremely traditional methods for creating these artworks. So they're taking check beads because of the way that they glisten and shine. They're tiny, though so, so tiny. And they're sewing them onto traditional Ndoba or, or Ndwango cloth, sorry about that. And this is actually in seven panels. And so it's basically uh, six panels behind. And then the cross is actually suspended on top of the other panels. And so what I've got here is I do have uh, some close-ups. And so I've got a, basically kind of your four corners. Now, I would argue that we're actually seeing something that we've seen before. We're seeing the sun, we're seeing that lightning strike, and then we're seeing, as we see the hints of the stars over here, again, we're seeing that acknowledgement of the, of, of the eclipse, of the darkness that comes across the land. Now, we're also seeing uh, that kind of that almost sun halo up at the top. This is going to be a very similar depiction of Christ to many of these European motifs that we see, but it has a little bit more color uh, and a little bit more of those traditional markings that you might find 
in Africa. Now, as we go to the other side, what you see, again, you've got that moon, you've got that stars, that eclipse imagery. And then we also have a tree. Uh, you know, whether it's going to be your Garden of Eden, whether it's going to be your perfect heaven, uh, kind of melded into a tree of life imagery. We've got this, this idea that trees are also about growth. They're about history. And this historical event is not something that we allow to stagnate and stay in history. This grows and it influences and it spreads its branches and it spreads its roots and it finds a way to become that foundation of the faith, that foundation of uh, the Christian religion. Now, as we come back over here, uh, we do also have, we've got the women at the base. We have kind of these effects of life, whether it is the passage of uh, the sacrificial animals, because of course, Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He replaces that need for the sacrifice. I find it fascinating, these little uh, ribbons that we have in here, uh, very similar to the ribbons that we uh, wear today for awareness. And of course, this is 2008. That's after that, uh, it, that idea of ribbons of awareness, the red ones uh, for HIV and for AIDS is going to be as part or is going to be part of the modern understanding. And then we have these rainbows as well. Now, rainbow, of course, is something we normally associate with the flood. But on a kind of a more broad <laughs> scheme, the rainbow is a sign of promises kept. And in argue, and it's uh, worth, I think, the argument that the crucifixion, of course, is the ultimate promise kept, the promise of a savior. And again, he doesn't save without, without being crucified, without that death. And so we have that kind of acknowledgement of the promise kept, that tree, that evolution from or the past into the present. Now, I also think that it's worth remembering that a lot of the works from this collective with these beads are to honor those that have passed. And so this is also the crucifixion of hope. This is the one that says, because Christ died, we can be reunited. Because Christ died, your life that was cut so short mm -hmm. can still have a happy ending in heaven. And I love that, that wonderful message of remind, of kind of bringing all of that together, the idea that Easter and the crucifix, it's not really two different stories. It is the same story. It is that story of hope, but that idea that you don't truly appreciate hope and blessings and uh, the amazing gift that Easter is without that pain and suffering that came before. And so with that, I think we've got about seven or eight minutes left of our one hour. And so why don't I open it up to the floor for questions, thoughts, ideas? Anyway. <laughs> hey, Megan, I'll just jump in and say that was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we we custom built this tour specifically for today. So to be to be honest, it was my first time uh, sitting through it, and I just I learned so much. Uh, so thank you for all the images and the stories. I think it was a, a great morning, and I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts. Megan, I was struck by that last one that mm -hmm. you did, and in a very strange way, I was wondering what that white thing was was it a building or was it a ticket or what you see on that uh down by the feet uh, oh like yeah card. that yeah because it does look like a credit card doesn't it yeah uh, it's like a, a, a either a metro ticket or a, yeah. or, or a building what what is do you think well, that's the interesting thing. I actually wasn't able to get a lot of definitive answers for iconography in this one. Okay. Um, there is something of a trend of modern artists being a bit mysterious. Uh, they don't want to put ideas in the viewer's head so often. 
uh, that the it's all about the relationship between the viewer and the subject. Um, a kind of more local example of that would be the Women's Vietnam Veterans Memorial by uh, Glenna Goodacre, where it's faith, hope, and charity, but she refuses to tell anybody which of the women she sculpted with each of those values in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I actually, yeah, that one, I, I noticed it and I pondered it. I was not able to come up with a very good, I, I wasn't able to find a description of that symbolism or iconography. If anybody has uh, a deep background in African art, I would love to uh, hear it. Admittedly, my background is a little bit more uh, kind of traditional European, uh, you know, the quintessential standard art history classes. I realized I forgot to actually tell my background. My background is in anthropology, museum studies, and art history. Mm -hmm. I studied at Indiana University. Um, however, I grew up in the uh, Lutheran tradition and so attended Lutheran school for about 10 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The other thing I found interesting was um, in all of the earlier pictures, and I can't remember all the names, the hand placement, the mm. placement of all the different hands in those pictures. Not so much in this, but let's see, yes, some of those. The hands, um, I, I had difficulty figuring out, you know, what, whose hands was what, <laughs> you know, they were just, it was just a little um, different, I must say, the way the hand placement was. Now, yeah, I that, will. In that one, most especially, yes. Yes. Well, this one, I think, is the most uh, busy with the, with the hands in different places. I will say I know hands are notoriously one of the hardest to draw and paint. Um, and so sometimes uh, having hands kind of all over the place and being a little disconnected, that can actually be a little easier for the artist. Uh, so you don't have to deal with the, the, the wrist and things like that. And I'm noticing that the sleeves come up very, very high on the hands actually here and here. Um, I believe that what we've got is the mother of Christ here cradling the head, uh, the woman in the green uh, with the side. I don't think we can see this. Uh, this woman's hand is uh, trying to give Mary comfort. And then we've got uh, Mary Magdalene over here and Veronica over here. I think that that's how that's uh, falling out there. I was just noticing in the, in the uh, blue figure in the back, that you can see it, the leg limb through the cloth as if the cloth is, mm. is diaphanous, which was that just, uh, you think had any symbolism or was that um, just the artist showing off that she can do that? <laughs> I think it's a little bit of the artist showing off since it does definitely look like there's actually three layers. Uh, there's probably, there's the yellow and then there's the uh, tan. However, that tan would be rather flesh-like uh in color underneath and so i think i think it's a little bit of showing off of layering <laughs> huh. and I, I mean you know she is she is painting at a time when there's a lot of very famous monks that are also painting like Fra Bart bartolomeo and a few others and so she she's kind of setting herself up uh and she specifically signs her paintings as the paintress so she, she wants you to know that she is a female artist that is basically trying to play, play with the, uh, the big guys, the big boys uh, in the, the Christian created Christian uh, art world. Megan, I have a question for you. Of course. Um, so this is obviously a virtual tour and this is a space that we've gotten into primarily because of course the pandemic and museums weren't open. Uh, also, it gives a lot more people access to this information, but later you're gonna be doing a live tour at the National Gallery of Art. So can you just walk us through like your creation <laughs> and development for each and some, you know, maybe pros for one or the other and what people might see later in the museum? Well, one of the things that you might, uh, so the, the big difference I would say is that this one, because it's virtual, I can pull whatever I want from whichever place I want. Some of that's in private collections. A lot of that is in international collections. That's why the sizes were in centimeters. Uh, 
and meters and metric because that's that's what a lot of the information was. Whereas at the National Gallery, uh, we are going to be focusing on male artists because that is what that gallery has in their collection for this particular topic and what they have on view. Most museums only put about three to 5% of their collection on display at any given time. So the other thing is, is that a lot of these paintings, even if they're in museum collections, are not necessarily on display at this moment. Now, many of the women that I focused on uh, are kind of getting a little bit of a resurgence of interest. Uh, there was a lot of virtual programs on female artists over the pandemic. And so we are starting to see some tastes uh, pulling things out. The National Gallery in London did a wonderful exhibition on Artemisa Gentileschi. Now, I was crushed. She did not have a crucifixion painting to put in here. Uh, she becomes known for her vengeful biblical heroines. So basically mm -hmm. the women that uh, basically murder and kill the enemies of the nation of Israel. And normally the woman doing the murdering is a self-portrait. Uh, but... <laughs> Yeah, she, she's kind of fantastic. So she just got a major exhibition in London at, the, at their National Gallery. So we are seeing more of them pulled out into storage. But for the virtual programs, I like kind of focusing on the things that you can't necessarily go see in person, either because of location, because of distance, because it's in storage, because it's in a private collection. So at the National Gallery, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about technique. I'm going to be talking a bit more about Veronica, about Mary Cleophas, about the Virgin Mary, about Mary Magdalene, and how we're seeing them at different points in time from different artists, and what that might be saying also about what's resonating with that period. And so I talked a little bit of it, like with Lavinia, how she was kind of like uh, working in a time period where there was this emphasis on family and this emphasis on the, uh, you know, that, that Christian structure um, where Platila Nelly, she's going to be working at a time when there's this encouragement to go back to the traditions of the faith and that pious living and a little bit of that, you know, a uh, sense of deprivation <coughs> where you're supposed to be focusing your free time on becoming a more, on a more pious lifestyle. And so those are gonna, we're gonna be talking a little bit more, I would say about the time period around the artist and a little bit more about the iconography and what the women that are included are telling us in the in-person tour. And again, it's mostly basically uh, based on that one we're working with what the gallery has put on the walls. This one, I try to bring in things that were harder to find. That is terrific. Thank you again. I think we can go ahead and close the program. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to Leslie and Jacob for working with us and giving us this opportunity to meet you all. And we're super excited for this afternoon. Yeah, for those of you that are, and I will basically be wearing this this afternoon, so the <laughs> light pink shirt with flowers. Uh, I might change into a slightly different gray cardigan, but that's that's basically what I'm going to be looking like. So. <laughs> uh, I will see you all at 6th and Constitution, hopefully. Uh, otherwise, I hope that you have a meaningful Lenten Sunday.